Right, well, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, webinar about all things Bocconi. Uh, my name is Mark Huntington. I'm from a company called A Star Future, who are hosting tonight's session. Um, basically, well, as we've described it in the title, we are rather hoping that this is your opportunity to learn about all things related to the university, uh, why it is a place that you should perhaps consider for your uh, bachelor's education, uh, where it's going to take you in life, what kind of things you need to get in and all the rest of it. Um, and also, obviously, we are joined this evening by three current students who will also share a little bit more about their experience. Um, before I get started, I will just say that if you have questions, that's kind of the whole point of the whole evening. Um, please use the Q&A function that you will find in the bottom um, so that we can, all of the panelists should be able to see those questions and we will get to them, if not immediately, certainly after you've heard from me. But I'm going to speak for a couple of minutes. First of all, I'm just going to load up a quick um, presentation about us. Just here we go. Okay, so all things Bocconi. This is, um, well, we've been working together with the university for about 15 years now uh, in the UK. And we've, over that time, seen quite a large number of um, British educated students uh, end up choosing to study in Milan. Um, so this evening, really what we want to do is focus specifically on this one university. But for those of you who are not familiar with us, uh, I just thought it a good point to just introduce ourselves a little bit. Essentially what we do is try to encourage British students to go and study abroad, to engage with opportunities outside the UK. Um, as I'm sure you are aware from a UK perspective, um, the temptation is to just you know, go to British universities very often. And really what we wanna do is just get people thinking a little bit further afield. Now, we have lots of universities that we work with. There's all sorts of things you can ask us about at other times. And uh, we have actually got quite a series of webinars going off in this next month on everything from the USA to the Netherlands, to medicine, to dentistry, you name it, all sorts of different things that you are welcome to get in touch with us to sign up for. But for this evening, we are just gonna specifically focus on one university. But if you do want to get hold of us at any time, we have a number of websites, the astarfuture.co.uk, studyinholland.co.uk. Uh, you're also welcome to email me, contact us on Twitter, and that also works on Instagram, that, uh, that handle as well, anytime that you want. But I don't really want to talk too much about me this evening, because the whole purpose of this is for you to learn more about the university. And for that reason, what I'd like to do now is introduce the first speaker, and that is uh, Mario Tabarini, who is actually the Head of Guidance and Recruitment at Bocconi, and he's going to give a short introduction to the university, after which I'm going to ask him a few questions, and then we'll move on to the next part of the evening. Thank you very much. All yours, Mario. Thank you so much, Mark. It is a pleasure for me to be here. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, everybody. So I'm going to share a very... Uh, quick presentation, I would say to leave the floor more on the Q&A and the students. So I don't know if you can see my, oh, this, this is done. Here we go. Sorry. Okay. Where am I? Sorry about that. So just one second, sorry about that. I'm sorry, it's gone. Mark, if you can upload it, I-, I I'm going to, I've got it, Mario, let me I'm just- really Sorry, I don't know what happened with this. Sorry, I need to do the shared screen. Sorry about this, everybody. Uh, these things happen, but here we go. Share screen. This, you should hopefully be seeing. Yes, thank you so much. Presentation Thanks. right now. All right. Um, so yes, just tell me when you want to move on. Mario. Yes, please. Sorry about that. It's only a few slides. Sorry, 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 guys. Let's start. So Bocconi University. So let's go to the next and, and the following one. Mark, please. 
because the next, the next one is me, and then the following uh, when we start. Okay, our history, Bocconi, it's a business school mainly, but, and it was born as a business school. Uh, it was born in 1902, very, very, uh, let's say, recent times for Italy. We have the oldest universities in the world, like, like Bologna, but we were the first one in Italy granting a degree in economics. Uh, and for many years, we've been the only one, actually. Uh, and we were first in many ways, in many things in Italy. Uh, for example, we were the first one doing an international exchange program back in 1974 with uh, New York University. And uh, consider that the Erasmus program that, that you all know uh, started in 1987, so well in advance. We were also the first one uh, in 2001 starting a degree, an undergraduate degree fully taught in English. So Bocconi has in its DNA the international uh, internationality. We've always been looking at the, at the international market, at the international world, not only at the Italian, the Italian domestic market. Uh, we are a mid-sized university. Not we, we don't do everything. We are focused on mainly on social sciences. Uh, so 4,700 students, of which the percentage of, of international students in our classes taught in English, which are the majority, it's 41%. So very international um, uh, campus. Uh, and it's confirmed by the fact that we have more than 100 nationalities uh, on campus, including students and faculty members. Thanks, Mark, for the following one. Uh, we are, uh, this is our placement worldwide. We are basically in any ranking, we, we put here the most, the most uh, famous, uh, we are basically top 20 in the world and top uh, five in Europe. Uh, uh, we are, uh, you know, ranked in our core disciplines, so business, economics, management, accounting, uh, social sciences at large, including political science and, and law. Uh, and uh, we are also, so we are very well placed uh, with ranking, but we are also a very good research university. This is confirmed by the, you know, the, the, the bottom part of the slide. Uh, we, in terms of receiving a European research grant, uh, we are in the top three, top four in Europe. And actually the two universities in front of us in this particular ranking, which is not a ranking, is the number of ERC European research grants given to, to, to faculty members are like, if I'm not wrong, in the first one are Oxford and Cambridge or Oxford and Imperial College. So so it's really a very top university compared also to the top UK institutions. Mark, thank you. Sorry about this, but it's okay. We're also very international. I mentioned it in my first slide. Uh, we have an international network which combines quantity and quality. We offer every year, every year over 2,000 opportunities for our students to study abroad uh, in 280, more than 280 partners in 54 countries. Uh, basically, if you take any, any ranking in any continent, we do exchange students with top schools in that continent. This is a fantastic networking opportunity for our students. Our students can go abroad in uh, you know, top schools in any country. Uh, we have, for example, exchanges with all the Ivy League schools in the US. It, this is probably one of the few, uh, few schools that has it. The Department of Economics at Princeton University have an exchange only with us, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and we, um, it combines this, 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 the, the fact also that our students can take advantage of uh, very, very uh, good pupils coming from all over the world in our courses, giving value, va value added. Uh, so it's, it's really a fantastic opportunity also that, that network. We also have double degrees. So the next one, which I think it's, uh, yeah, it's employer relations. We are very well connected with the, with the market uh, and with the, the employers uh, in Italy, but not only in Italy. Uh, you see 2,500 employees involved in activities. We have activities on campus. Of course, this, this, this time, this year for everybody is less on campus and more online, but, but still uh, there are uh, many, many, many opportunities for our students. Uh, nearly 11,000 internship and job offers. Actually, uh, the, this year, last year, sorry. It's um, actually, it's like that our students are giving offer of internship or job or, or job opportunities uh, more than one. They, they receive many, many, uh, many offers and they are able to choose. This is fantastic for us. Also, thank to our incredible uh, network of alumni worldwide, uh, 1,000 and 120,000 120, uh, worldwide, many, many in the UK, many in London, of course, but not only in London. And we organize career fairs in Italy and abroad. We have our London fair, which has been transformed this year online to a to digital event uh, called UK in Ireland. 
and the placement of our students is, is very good. The second indicator, 95.7, is the one that we give to the Financial Times for their rankings. And actually, it's the top in for the master in, in international management. Basically, it's the top one of the of the of the list of the Financial Times. So the placement is very good. Most of our students stay in Italy because we still have a, a good number of Italian students. The majority are Italian students, but uh, more than uh, than nearly a third work abroad one year after after graduation. I have another, another slide, which is an overview of our programs. I will not go into details about that. It's like we do, as said, only a few things. So uh, the, the, the previous one, Mark, thank you. It's, um, it's uh, uh, management. We do management. We do economics. We do finance. We do political science starting in 2015 and very, very uh, upcoming uh, degree we have uh, in that degree there is a mandatory exchange program where we have exchanges with all the top politics departments from uh, all over the world uh, we have two new kits in the block one uh, 2017 created uh, economics management and computer science and the other one math for ai math and mathematical and computer science for artificial intelligence the two, these two courses uh, you know um, broaden the, the the scope of our university doing more things crossing between uh, let's say economics and management and mathematics uh, uh, physics uh, you know hard sciences uh, uh, computer science of course uh, statistics uh, so it's uh, and it's demanded by the job market uh, the job market said to us yes do those courses because the students who, who do the those disciplines are very very you know have a, a profile which is uh, more complete i would say combines the management skills with the hard skills uh, and technological skills then we have the last one is our uh, let's say um, uh, flagship program it's a world bachelor in business a four-year programs where that uh, gives the students a possibility well i forgot to say that our degrees are three years the previous ones in italy by law you have two, three years degrees so this one is four years because you get three degrees one u.s degree one uh, italian degree and one uh, Hong Kong degree from the uh, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. Uh, the two partners are Hong Kong University of Science and Technology and the University of Southern California, the Marshall School of Business. Together with Bocconi, these schools are top, like, say, let's say top, top 10 in their continent. So it's really a top program and you get the three degrees. It was created in 2013. And so far to our knowledge, there is no equivalent program in the world. And it's also very convenient because you don't pay the full, you get a full degree, which is a US degree also, by paying only one year possibly in the, in the US, which is the first year. Second year is in Bocconi, uh, sorry, is in, uh, in Hong Kong, third year in Bocconi, and the fourth year, uh, the students decide where to go. Uh, yes, then we have some programs in Italy. I think I'm done with these slides and uh, then I'm, I'm available, of course, uh, here for questions, Mark. Thank you very much, Mario. That was a very useful introduction and oversight or overview of the university as a whole. And we will be going back to that presentation a little bit later on, as you will have seen the, the nuts and bolts, the admissions details and stuff. Uh, Elisa is going to focus on that a little bit later on in this session. Um, but I'd just like to pick up on a couple of things that Mario said um, during his introduction to the university there. And the first one relates to the programs. I mean, obviously, you mentioned there um, future focused programs, the introduction of like the maths program and the AI and computing science programs. Um, these are obviously just likely to attract students that are not your traditional core market, shall we say. But do these programs also feed into the other programs as well? Would you say that they are also becoming more uh, focused on, well, I don't want to say focused on the needs of employers, but perhaps developing digital skills within an economics degree, for example? Is that is that part of what you're trying to achieve? Well, we, we are all living in a digital world. So I think every every course we need to 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 have uh, to have that that part, that component. For example, Bocconi started a couple, three years ago. I think uh, the claim of our rector was very actually more than three years. I think it was four or five years. He said coding is the new English because, you know, for non-English speakers like Italians, English is a must. It has always been a must. Now, besides English, you also need coding as a must. So for example, our rector decided to introduce a mandatory Python course in our uh, bachelor degrees uh, uh, to uh, all degrees. So not only the more, let's say technical ones, but also for example, the degree in political science, you need to have a coding course. 
for example. So yes, there are courses which are more focused on uh, quantitative skills, like economics is quite, is not light, uh, the, the, more, the more technical one that I mentioned, that we mentioned. Uh, and then you have some courses like management or finance or political science, where that component is less present, but still it's present, yeah, it's present. Okay, so there's an acknowledgement that the future skills that are, are going to require coding alongside all the other, you know, core skills that you, you teach as well there. Um, I do have to say, and, I, and I, I, that obviously I follow what's going on in international higher education in lots of different countries, lots of universities around the world. Um, Bocconi is not unique in reaching this conclusion. You know, lots of places are now focusing more on these future skills. Um, clearly, you gave a very, very strong uh, argument from a ranking perspective um, as to why people should be looking at Bocconi. Um, but is there anything else you could say about why you would choose Bocconi beyond, you know, a list of numbers that you could put on a slide? What is it you feel that, you know, the kind of the real ethos, if you like, of the university when it comes to helping people with these challenges of getting jobs afterwards? No, I like, you know, I, I like very much Bocconi. I've been working here for, for, for many years. Uh, the, it, it's in Italy, so... Uh, you know, you have to get out of your comfort zone. If you come from UK, if you are, for example, a UK citizen, uh, you can go, you know, any other place, uh, definitely, and that would be a valuable experience. I, I would recommend, uh, you know, to, go, to get out of the comfort zone. So go, going to Italy is getting out of the comfort zone because you are, you know, in a different country with a different language. Uh, but you can do it in a safer way, like Bocconi, it's uh, English speaking, uh, the university, the students, the faculty members, the staff. And it's in Milan, which is the most international city in Italy. Uh, if uh, an international company has a branch and headquarter in, or now they call it headquarters, not headquarters, they're changing it, a headquarter in, in Italy, that will be in the Milanese area, is the engine of the Italian economy, the, the Milanese area. So it, it's a kind of safe landing, uh, but at the same time, you can live a full experience. I recommend also the students to learn Italian while they're here. Why not? Uh, it's, it's recommended to any place in the world, not only, not only in Italy, of course, but, but you know, and, and you are, you know, you live the Mediterranean way of life, uh, the, you know, the Italian way of life. That's, that's a very nice part of the experience. I always recommend it's a full experience. It's not only about academics, of course. It's not only about top business school or top school in, in anything. It's also a, a life experience. And I think Italy, Milano, and the university combines all of that. Okay. And obviously, we spoke a little bit about internships during your uh, introduction there as well. I don't want to go over that too much with you, Mario, because we've got three live, stu live real students who I'm going to revisit that point with quite a bit. But obviously, we are talking about an international university, Bocconi is certainly international, in Italy. Um, but specifically, I guess a lot of the people on this call um, might be thinking about job prospects in the UK after they graduate, or indeed in other countries that possibly are neither Italy nor the UK. Um, what would you say for somebody, and I, I mean, is there any real evidence or experience that you can point to about British employers? Uh, do they come to your campus, for example, to recruit your students in, in normal times? Um, how can you reassure somebody that Bocconi is as wise a move as, I don't know, Oxbridge, LSE, when it comes to getting into those circles of employment in the UK afterwards? Oh, absolutely. We, we have the three students, so for sure they will, uh, they will tell about their, their experience. No, Bocconi is very much recognized by the job market also in the UK. Uh, not only in Italy, not only in other places. If that question, tw 20 years ago, it was a different world, you know, it was not as connected as now. Now everybody's knowing everything and uh, we're very much connected. If you go, for example, to London, to give you a, a practical example, and you talk to any investment bank, to any people in any investment bank or bank, uh, they will know Bocconi, they will know Bocconi. It's one of the, the universities that places the most of the students in, in that area, for example. Not only that, also international organization, It's nowadays, I think in the last uh, 10, 15 years, uh, let's say I would say 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was top in Italy, but not uh, recognized worldwide so much. Nowadays, it's really recognized as a top place worldwide. So on the point of view of the, of the, of the um, possibilities of working possibilities, I don't see any, uh, any less possibility for students to come to Bocconi. In fact, I would say there would be more possibilities compared to the, let's say, mid-tier uh, mid uh, or uh, third, um, second, third-tier universities in the UK. Yeah. Okay. 
Right. Thanks, Mario. Well, what I'd like to do now is just ask you one final question before we move on to um, other uh, participants on this event. And hopefully you'll stick around for any questions that are, are relevant to your, your area of expertise later. Um, but we've spoken a lot about why Bocconi might be right for people, but what kind of people are right for Bocconi? I mean, do you what do you really look for um, in candidates for the university? How would you recognize a Baconian before they even set foot on your campus, for example? No, we like very much motivated students uh, who find uh, you know, interest in our disciplines. Of course, we, we don't offer everything. So you cannot apply to Bocconi if you're not motivated in, and interested in, in our disciplines. Uh, and this is already you know, uh, you know, uh, uh, a point of reference. And we also, we also we like uh, students who you know, want to find the consistency with, with their study plan. You know, if they, they, at high school they study something, they like very much something, then uh, they, they would go for, for that. And uh, uh, you know, if, if a student is not interested in quantitative disciplines or you know, economics, political science, then I don't think uh, it's, it's, it's a place to be. Uh, I don't want students who, you know, they, they, they go to Bocconi just because it's a top school. That, that happens everywhere in the world. I don't think, generally speaking, not only for Bocconi, that's a good choice. You have, you have to follow your, your, your instinct. Sometimes it's funny because you have, we have students, you know, who have the, their parents who did Bocconi, <laughs> everybody in the world. Sometimes, you know, they apply, but probably they apply because they were convinced by the, the parents. That's not, that's not right. So my message is here, if you're interested in those disciplines, then put Bocconi in your radar together with other schools because that's the place to be. If you're not interested in those disciplines, if you're interested in doing, I don't know, medicine or something else, there's no point in, in you know, in, in, in for right. That. But one very key thing there you've said, I mean, I know that um, for all that Bocconi is now a very international university, it's also quite a traditional Italian one in some respects, certainly as far as the, the business community is concerned. But the message I'm getting there loud and clear is just because my or dad went there, you know, You've got to make your own decision, but if you can recognize that these are the right disciplines for you, maybe this is the way to go. So thank you very much, Mario, for your input there. Um, what I'd like to do now is invite our three students to, um, well, reveal themselves um, so that we can hear a little bit about them. Um, we've got, first of all, I'm going to come to you, Massey. Um, you were described earlier on in this um, session as be, having done the full Bocconi experience. Um, so um, perhaps you could share with us you know, just in a couple of minutes in your own words, a little bit about your, um, you know, your journey, why it is you ended up there, what you've done while you were there. Okay, so uh, a bit about myself. I am half English, half Italian. Uh, my mother's Italian, my dad's English, and I grew up in the UK. Uh, so I went to City of London School, and upon completion of my A-levels, I had the choice of where do I want to go. Um, being half Italian and interested in the international scope of things, I decided it would probably be better to look abroad. I didn't really see myself matching with the classic English culture. So I started looking at, you know, the top universities abroad. Um, my Italian tutor at the time actually uh, mentioned Bocconi um, and my father, who was an investment banker, had already heard of it as well. Um, so he started advising me to check it out. And uh, around, I think, November, I ended up going to Milan to do um, like a visit and do the Bocconi test. Um, I managed to get in and I ended up doing the um, political science course because I was the second year of which it existed. Uh, so that was 2016. <laughs> um, it's a while ago now. So uh, having started that, um, I you know, successfully passed my first two years. Then I did uh, my exchange program in France at Sciences Po. Um, after that, I applied for the master's degree and I got in and now I'm doing a master's in management, which I'm almost finishing. Uh, I hopefully, fingers crossed, I finish in around June, let's say. Okay. Um, and then I complete the five years of Bocconi. So it's five years of life in Milan, minus a short period of time in France. Yeah, um, exactly. what, what's going to be next for you then, Massey? Have you, uh, presumably, you must have given that some thought by now. Um, yeah. Do you have plans for June or thereafter? So um, I'm interviewing with um, some consulting firms right now, uh, and I've also done applications to do a law conversion as well in the UK. Um, so we'll see where that ends up. But I think probably uh, most likely going to consulting or finance. Right. And I know this is a very unusual year in terms of, you know, COVID and campus and all the rest of it. But do you feel, I mean, has Bocconi been instrumental in introducing you to potential future employers, would you say? 
Yes, yes. I mean, they've managed to very quickly shift all of the Bokonian jobs online, um, all the virtual career affairs all online, and you're constantly reminded about the new ones. So, for example, I think maybe a month and a half ago, we had the finance one, right. and we were constantly told, you're given the opportunity to discover it yourself. So you're constantly reminded to show up to the virtual, uh, the fairs, the different um, aspects. And obviously you only show up to the ones that interest you. Sure. Okay. Um, so yeah, they, they definitely give you the opportunity to make your own decision and find a future path. Right. Thank you very much, Marcy. I mean, oh, right. please stick around. I mean, if you've got questions for him, please do put them in the Q&A, put them in the chat, and we will come back to them. But for now, I'd just like to keep sort of moving through. And I'd like to come to Carla next. Um, Carla, perhaps you can tell us a little bit about who you are and how you ended up in, in Milan and what you're doing there. Okay, well, first of all, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Carla. I am half German, half Italian. So I do have an Italian route. And like, like Maxi, um, my father knew about Bocconi and he actually applied himself, but didn't actually end up going. So I kind of fulfilled that desire of his, but also... I made the leap of faith to leave London because I had been living there for 17 years previously. I went to a state school in West London um, and I was the only person to have left the UK and I still am three years on. I still don't know anyone who's left Europe, but a lot of my friends have come to visit and it's really a unique path to take to leave. Um, and I'm doing also international politics at Bocconi. Um, I'm in my last year and um, I've really enjoyed it so far. I had an internship last summer with um, an organization called Project Syndicate, which was like an international political media organization that um, I actually got through networking through people I'd met in Bocconi. So, um, and maybe another notable story that is interesting for the participants is that I had an interview with PwC uh, two years ago in my first year and out of all of the people applying, they were all from LSE and King's College and I was the only non Bokoni student, but I still got to the final round and actually got a job offer. So that's another encouraging aspect is that we do have this kind of unique angle. When you're surrounded by students who only went to London universities, you do tend to stick out in that sense. Right. Does that mean then, would you say that you don't really come across that many people who were educated in the UK in your classes? I mean, are there Brits or people from the UK of an international background. I mean, yes, you're half German, you're half Italian, you're very London, I would say. Yeah. I mean, are there many people from that kind of background or completely different, shall we say? I would say if you really if you really want to find that, you definitely can. I mean, I knew Thibaut, um, I've met him in Bocconi and we obviously bonded over being from London. So there is, I would say like I've met at least 10 to 20 people from the UK and most of them from London, in fact. But um, I really enjoyed it, like meeting these Europeans and people I would have never have met if I hadn't come here. But if you do miss home, you can obviously go back, back and visit your friends who are in university or certainly find some similarity in cultural, like common, like with Thibaut in London was great to have that here as well. But I mean, I do know, and I will say on behalf of the university, that anybody from anywhere in the UK is welcome. This is not an entirely London session, not by any stretch of the imagination. I have zero links to London. I would certainly have happily gone and studied over them myself, and hopefully some of the people on this uh, session tonight will, will do likewise. But Colour, I did also want to move on and ask you uh, about a slightly different aspect of mm -hmm. university life. Um, aside from your academics, um, what kind of activities and things do you get involved in there? Uh, society-wise, I mean, I know obviously this year has been, or like this and last year, will have been interrupted in terms of what you can physically actually achieve. Um, but how would you describe the your sort of extracurriculars around your degree? Well, so um, I am in an association called 180 Degrees Consulting, like Thibaut again. It's uh, obviously a consulting association. Even though this year has been difficult, we've still managed to do projects, and you basically are in a team and you get given uh, a client who has a problem and you're, it's a nonprofit. So you're helping these kind of social projects to grow and find fundraising or do a marketing strategy. So this is something that you get to integrate with different years. Again, another opportunity to meet people outside your class because it's, you know, only socialize with people in your class. In fact, most of my friends are not in my subject. Um, and 180 is one of the ways we can do that. 
but there are other associations, uh, some sport ones. I'm also in a surfing association where we actually take more of an environmental aspect, looking at surfing industry and how that's been affected by climate change. Um, and then of course, I spent a lot of time, uh, I used to with the nightlife and going out was obviously a really great aspect of Milan for me, personally. <laughs> Italy is a fun place for that, but Milan is not on any beaches, is it? Just in case no, you're no. confused by surfing chat there. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much, Carla. Um, hopefully you can stick around for a little while again if any questions come up. Uh, but now I would just like to move on to Thibaut. Perhaps you can uh, tell us a little bit about who you are and uh, what your experience of Bocconi is has been. Yeah, sure. Um, well, I'm, I'm, my name's Thibault, I'm a third year BF, so Econ and Finance student, choosing to graduate in finance. Um, I'm half French, half British, so both my parents are French, but I, was, I grew up in London. Um, split up between a French school, so, and then I went to Whitgift School to do my A-levels. Um, when I, when I made the choice to leave Milan, uh, there was actually my friends who, who, who started talking about it, and I, I didn't know about Bocconi, and then I, I, I talked to my father who, who's in banking, so he definitely knew of it. And I thought that the experience of leaving the UK was very enriching and it, and it has been so far. Um, other than that, I mean, yeah, my big experience has been, has been great. I met crazy people, like Carla said, that I never th thought I'd, I'd have met like, without um, the uni experience. I completed two internships um, in the summer between my first and my second year. Uh, I worked for the NG energy company um, and I did some some interesting stuff on, on renewable energies and, and energy stock storage and everything. And last summer I did an insur um, an internship at an insurance firm in Zurich. Um, and that was also very interesting and and people and you start to see the recognition of people um, when you do say you come from Bocconi and it, it becomes and even then, in my inst when I was still in in in, in school, I went my off my post GCSEs internship. Most of the Italian people on, on trading floors did come from Bocconi, so it clearly shows that there, there has been a, a a change in in the industry, and you don't have to be from a London uni to get into those those kind of positions. So yeah, feel free to ask any questions. Okay, well, Tiba, I've got one for you straight up. Um, you're obviously in your final year of your bachelor's degree right now. And um, what's going to come next for you? Do you have you got a clear plan or? A um, well, I'm I'm currently revising for my GMAT, which is a bit intense. Well, we've got exams at the moment, but I'm currently revising for my GMAT as well. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm looking at applying at HSC in Paris. So that would bring me back to my French origins, even though it's an international program. Or applying to the LSE, or applying to the to the Bocconi Masters. But the, the 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 important thing is that Bocconi does put you on a pedestal to then apply to those, those kind of masters. And it, it, it is a very well recognized school. And, yeah. Good, well, hopefully that will, your education at and least also, get in. I do, I do also see a question from Sally in the Q&A. Um, Sorry, I'm saying that all, this, all of the students clearly speak Italian. Sally, I, I, I don't, I mean, after three years of living here, I have learned how to order a pizza in Italian, but apart from that, I, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not an Italian fluent and it hasn't hindered my my social capacities in any way. I mean, either most students in, in Bocconi speak English or Italian is not that hard to understand. Like you, You'll get the hang of it. Right. But again, they do have language lessons. Do you not have language requirements as part of your actual degree? We do. And I, I did. I did pass my Italian, uh, my Italian exam. Uh, although I cannot say that I, that has made me absolutely fluent and <laughs> completely able to to, to, to to juggle with the language. Right. But I guess the other two, you're half Italian anyway. So did you yeah. presumably speak the language when you arrived there or? Yeah, it was my first language. Oh, sorry, go for it. No, you go ahead. Uh, my parents got divorced when I was really young, so Italian was actually my first language. Um, but then obviously living in the UK, my accent wasn't the best. So then coming here, uh, because I'm not officially uh, officially like Italian, I don't have the passport. So, so they made me take the Italian classes, which was entertaining to say the least. Um, but you're, yeah, you have to do two languages throughout your degree. So uh, first and a second language. So I took Italian and French. Nice. Okay. 
Oh, and uh, for me, I my my Italian has improved. I never came. I didn't come here fluent. I was actually quite bad at Italian. And then obviously it was a big opportunity. And another reason why I wanted to come here was like to increase my language capabilities because in my school language was really poorly taught. So I also did French here and you get qualifications as well that go well on your CV. You have like the actual level and certificate with it. So, yeah. Right. But would you say that, you know, at Bocconi yourself, you're kind of in an, an English bubble in Milan. I mean, I noticed from my own experience of having visited the university, the closer you get to the actual campus, the more you start hearing English in background conversations. Whereas in the majority of the city, it's just not there at all, is it really? You know? no, I'd have to agree 100 percent. Most conversations are held. I'd have to agree. Yeah, I, I agree with that as well. It's it's sort of even though we don't, there isn't a, a proper out of city campus. There clearly is like a Bocconi area, and yeah. and mm. the, the the shop owners in that area mostly speak English. And yeah, that. yeah, great. So you can feel at home no matter how Italian you actually are. So you'll always fit yeah. in. Okay, well, thank you very much, you guys. Um, I will be looking at the question. I, sorry, while I've been talking, I haven't really had a chance to look at the chat and the Q&A on this, but I will st uh, do that and I will curate those and come back and start asking about those. Um, but hopefully for everybody on this call now, you've had a bit more of a sense of um, what the experience itself is like. Uh, and I'd now like to move on to more sort of practical considerations of I mean, I asked Mario in the broadest terms, you know, who is a suitable candidate for Bocconi, but Elisa can now perhaps explain a little bit more about the journey that would see people actually arrive at the university. Now, so Elisa, if you can unmute yourself, do you want me to share screen or are you okay? To uh, no, I do have a slide, so let me try and see. You can do that. Uh, yep. So it won't bother you every time I have to change one. Okay, there we go. Okay, perfect. Um, so hi everybody, uh, my name is Elise and I work as well in the Bocconi Guinness Recruitment Office. I used to travel to UK schools, usually with Mark. Uh, this year it has only been a Zoom visit. Uh, so I think, you know, this is what we're used to right now. Uh, what I'll try and do in this, you know, in the next few minutes is actually give you an overview of the application process for Bocconi University. Um, the application process is pretty straightforward. Um, what we consider for students are three main elements. The first one are your school reports from your second to last and third to last year of high school. So if you're doing a British curriculum, this would mean the GCSEs and the AES's level year, so grade 12 and 13. Um, if you're doing the IB, this would mean the middle year programs or the GCSEs and the IB year one. French Bac, second and première, so second and third last year of high school final GPA. After that, we consider we we need you to uh, apply with a test. You can either apply with an international test such as the SAT or the ACT, or we do have our own test, which is called Bocconi test. So I know the question about the scores is coming up. I already I already saw one in the chat, so I'm mentioning them straight away. If you're applying, there are no minimum scores. Uh, in neither of those tests, but there are suggested scores. So in the SAT, if you're applying with that, we usually suggest students to try and score above 1,300, 1,350 possibly from that score up, uh, your application starts to be competitive. Um, ACT 28, 29 up, again, not threshold, but an indication of you know, the usual candidate that is competitive at, uh, competitive at Bocconi, sorry. As per the Bocconi test, we know this year there have been a lot of SATs and ACT test cancellations, so this has been a concern for a lot of students and families. Uh, that's why uh, we have our own test that since this year has gone entirely online. It's a multiple choice test, 50 questions in 70 minutes, covering math, logic, numerical reasoning, reading comprehension, and you can do it from the safety of your home. home. Uh, we have a system that, you know, you just do it on your laptop uh, and there's a control system that ensures that you're not cheating or anything. But that's, let's say, an option that you have instead of SAT or ACT. Uh, we do not have a preference between one of these three tests, but you need to do one of the three and then, uh, you know, upload with the score. Uh, uh, sorry, apply with the score. The third element that we consider for admissions is your CV and your personal statement. Of course, we do not expect you to have work experience uh, since you're still in high school, but what we want to see in your CV is whatever you've done besides high school, any volunteering activity, any extracurricular activity, any passion you have, you would like to share with us. 
plus the personal statement. In this one, we really want you to underline why you're applying to Bocconi, why to those courses, and what makes you a different candidate compared to the other. What would you want to achieve by studying at Bocconi? I have to be honest, so the two most important elements that we consider in the application process are actually your GPA and the test result. The CV and the personal statement are a sort of residual part, but we always consider that. Um, you see here listed the English certificate, of course, if you're, uh, if you're attending a, you know, uh, an English taught um, high school diploma, so whether it's British qualification, A-levels, um, or the IB, uh, or the American diploma, you don't need that. If you're not attending a fully taught English diploma, then you would need an English certificate as well. Uh, one thing I would like to add is that when you apply, you will be able to list up to four courses you're interested in, the ones, and you sort of rank them. So the first one you list is the one you're, you're interested in most, and then you can list three additional others just in one application. Uh, so it gives you the chance to sort of apply to more than one choice, and, you, and usually it's better to do it because it gives us the chance to consider you for more than one program. So it sort of, you know, increases a bit the chances of being admitted. Um, one last thing I would like to point out about the application process is that compared to UK universities in specific, we do what we call unconditional offers. So if we offer you a place, this is not tied to your final um, high school diploma grades, so to your final A-level grades or IB grades, provided that, of course, you graduate with a full diploma. This doesn't mean that we want you to sleep during the last year of high school or not do, uh, you know, or not study or do your homework, but what it means is that for us, it's a way of evaluating your previous academic performance and then we evaluate your skills with the test. But once you get accepted, we stick your name to the place and that's yours. So it's not tied to how, uh, you know, to, to your final um, high school diploma grade and mark. Uh, we do have, however, uh, requirements, uh, especially for the A-levels to the uh, British diploma, you need to graduate with at least three A-levels or three pre-use, um, as you wish. Uh, for the IB, you need to, of course, get a full IB diploma, so we do not accept the IB curriculum. If you're attending an American high school, then you would have to do three APs on top of your uh, American diploma. For the French system, I know there are some French lycée students here today, um, you just need to graduate with your full French BAC, and we do not have any preference related to any of the French, um, you know, tracks, uh, even math related. So you can apply with the French back as well. When should you apply? Well, Sorry, guys. I don't know. Okay. Uh, so when should you apply? Well, if you're a last year student, so if you're graduating in 2021 and you want to start in fall 2021, we have two selection rounds that are still available. One is the winter session that is closing super soon on the 25th of January, and then the spring session that runs from mid-March mid to early April. Um, first suggestion, if you're really interested in Bocconi and you haven't applied yet, you should think of applying in the winter session because that one together with the first one you see mentioned here, the early session is the biggest selection round. So between the first two rounds, the early and the winter session, we usually allocate something around the 80% and 85% of the available places. Um, so the spring session is what we call a residual round. So we have higher chances to you know, get accepted in the first two rounds, but still we do have spots also in the last one. Um, if somebody here is from, it will be graduating in 2022, so you're still, you still have time to think about it, keep this one as a general reference. Usually our early session is a session that is dedicated to junior students, so to students who are still in their second to last year of high school, and it usually takes place at the end of June throughout, uh, sorry, in May, June, and then the evaluation is done throughout the summer. The dates you see here have been pushed back this year a bit because of COVID, um, but what you should expect if you're graduating in 2022 is to have a first selection round at the end of your junior year and two during your senior years. Year. Um, I think from my side, Mark, generally speaking about admission, that's it. I don't want to go into too much details. Maybe you do have some questions or some question popped up here in the chat. Right. Well, I will start in with a with a couple of questions. I mean, obviously, you mentioned COVID and the impact on those timings. We are seeing they are slightly different from uh, previous years. And also, you mentioned the fact that the Bocconi test can be done online this year. Don't count on that always being the case, but that's, that has happened. Um, but it was one question I wanted to ask you, um, kind of related, um, but going a step further back in people's journey before they're actually going to absolutely get a fill in the form and apply. Um, 
usually when a candidate is engaging with the university for the first time, and I've been working with Bocconi obviously for quite a while now, um, I know that the, the typical initiatives you use are things like, well, obviously open days and summer schools and so on. How are those working at the moment? I mean, how would you advise somebody who maybe this is tonight their first inkling that Bocconi really exists? Maybe they've heard something about, yep, I want to work in investment banking, bang, this is what I want to do. Um, but maybe they don't, they're not at a school which has had the benefit of having sent many, many candidates to you over the last few years. Um, where would you start? Uh, open days are a great occasion to sort of, re, you know, research a bit more about a specific university and in our case about Bocconi, uh, because during an open day, usually you are able to listen to bachelor programs presentations, hear admission talks, uh, chat with the fees and funding office, with the guidance recruitment people and with students. Uh, I always say that, you know, it's very important to talk to your peers, talk to students like the ones we have here today that, you know, were in your shoes just a few years ago. So they really know what what it feels like they have been what you are being through now so that they can help you give giving you also some real i would say advice and insight about the university and an open day is a sort of event where you have all these things together um in our case so last we used to do an open day of course on campus so we did one last february on campus with all international students it was amazing of course, this year, this is not possible. So what we're doing is that we have transferred that online. We are having our open day actually this Saturday. It will run the entire day and you can really pop in when you want. We have a schedule, a schedule sorry, with all the um, different sessions. You can attend the session programs that you'd like. We also have a sort of introduction by the rector where, where if you or your family, your parents maybe also want to have a bit of a a more specific overview about the job prospects, the rankings, the standing of the university per se, then that's useful as well. Um, you can still register if you want. So maybe at the end of the webinar, I can pop in the registration link. So if you guys want, you can do that. And another thing is the summer school that you mentioned. We, so we've been running the high school summer school for a few years now. Uh, we've always run, run it in person. Uh, last year, we have transferred it online. We're still working on next year's summer, so 2021, actually, uh, summer school. Um, and the format that, you know, will take place, we'll know it in a few weeks. But whether it's online or in person, I would say that the summer school, it's a great way to test whether the university is the right place for you. I would say that's at a later, uh, let's say, stage in the decision process. So the open day is good, you know, in the first stages because you get the overview of the university. Whereas once you have sort of shortlisted you know, the universities that you're interested in and you know the Bocconi is, you know, one of those ones, then why not come and study for two weeks with Bocconi professors, Bocconi current students and see if the environment really fits you. Um, if the way we teach, uh, you know, and the environment, the, the environment, the campus is what what you're looking for. So um, for those students who are very interested, but are, are not 100% sure, I think the summer school can be um, a great way to um, make a final uh, resolution. Right. Sorry, I, I, you may have answered this and I might have just missed it, but the summer schools this year, are they, has the decision already been made for those to be online or will they be in person or are you waiting and seeing? Uh, we're kind of waiting and seeing. I think the, the what we hope to do is to do, you know, sort of blended format. So to have it both on, in person and online to give, you know, the opportunity to students to do to decide how they want to, to join us. But um, I don't think it, it has 100% been decided yet. It's something we're still working on, of course, as you know. The current worldwide situation <laughs> requires cool. a bit of flexibility. Yeah. <laughs> Mario, do you want to add something? Oh, we, we are waiting. We are waiting a bit. I think we will decide by mid-February. Uh, we we didn't open the applications yet. We published the offer. Actually, it's on our website. The the, the list of courses and labs that we have. But but we will wait until uh, mid-February to open the application. <laughs> Uh, we want to delay it a bit because, you know, to see how it goes. And for sure, there will be the online option. This is for sure. Uh, regarding the physical, uh, we have to, you know, wait and see a bit. Right. We'd love to. Yeah. But... Of course, we all want to get back to normal as soon as we can. Uh, but Mario, one thing I remember speaking with you on a, on a recent call was about, you know, just thinking about ways that students can potentially engage with the university and get a bit more of a sense of what a Bocconi education involves. Uh, you were talking about Coursera. There are things that you have on? Well, we do have on Coursera some courses. Very nice uh, from our professors. Free of charge, you just go to Coursera, Digit Bocconi, 
and find the list of uh, of courses uh, on topics, of course, that we we are good at, and uh, and it's very interesting. And the level it's it's quite okay. You can you can attend it even if you are a high school uh, student who is not familiar with those topics. It's really it's really nice. It's you know a way to also understand a similar way to, to the summer school. Even if it's the summer school is online, it's a good you know you don't live the the, the the campus life, but you you know you get acquainted with the disciplines and you know. Uh, you you may know better uh, which are your interests. Uh, I would say also that that is a plus. Okay, so for those of you who are not familiar with Coursera, uh, we can certainly send you out a link so you can have a look at uh, what particular programs that are there. But I do know that um, you know the summer schools get you know a few hundred people on them. Uh, Coursera gets a few hundred thousands sometimes. So there are some really really good uh, popular programs on there. Now. Just moving on, there was one question I wanted to ask, and this is specifically to, to Carla right now, um, because the reason I'm asking you, Carla, is because I know, that Mas I know the answer from Marcy and Thibault, because I know which schools they went to, and I know the people who would have helped them through the process at their school, but I have no idea with you. Um, how did you find the actual application process? Was your school in any way helpful, confused by what you were doing? Did you do it pretty much by yourself? And if so, how straightforward was it, really? Um, I'm going to be honest, it, the school was really not so cooperative on it. They, they hadn't, first of all, it was actually the first year in the school. It was a very brand new secondary school, but um, they really weren't equipped to deal with it. But the application process was not that difficult. You just had to have a few basic certificates, like proof that you did your A-level or you're doing your A-levels. You've done your GCSEs, a cover letter. So it wasn't that difficult of a process, but I did the uh, Bocconi test. I didn't do the SAT. So I flew to Milan and I did it in the spring session, so the latest session. I would recommend to do it not in the last session, but I just found out about Bocconi's application process really late on. Um, but yeah, overall the application process was good and I think it was really very comforting because A-levels was a very stressful time, as I'm sure everyone knows. Um, and Bocconi gave a kind of unconditional offer. So once you get in, you need to meet very minimum requirements on your A-levels in the end. So as long as you get in with a good SAT score or you do very well in the test, it's a very comforting offer to have. Right. Forward, yeah. Thanks very much, Carla. We are now getting some more questions, which are certainly ones that I want to put to all three of you now while you are still on here. Um, this first one is about what are living arrangements like? Do most students live in student accommodation and do they have roommates? I don't know if that means, are you sharing a room or are you sharing a flat or how, how does it work? Um, Perhaps, yeah, you can talk about, and I guess for, for all of you, I, I think we're more interested in what your uh, first year experience would be rather than the living arrangements you might have ended up with now. Um, I'll start just because, yeah, I'll start. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I tried to get into accommodation, but the, I didn't manage to get any. So there, student accommodation is quite a popular thing in Bocconi. They have two or three very near, like practically on campus. And they have some 10 minutes walk away, 20 minute walk away, so forth. So the most popular ones are the ones closest to your lecture halls. And that's certainly a good option, but your roommates are kind of randomly selected. Um, so I had to find an apartment and I did through WhatsApp in the end. There was this amazing group chat where you would do a survey about what your favorite music is, how late you stay up. Are you an introvert and extrovert and then it would put you in a compatible some some kid actually made this like compatibility excel sheet so you could see who you're most compatible with and then go and message them um so i actually found my my flat like my flatmate my current flatmate still three years on contacted me through this whatsapp group and then we together found another girl so three of us live five minutes away from campus and that really worked out very well but there's definitely lots of facebook groups and whatsapp groups that you can find if you do want to go into an apartment, which is a really good option, honestly. Right. Tibor, Max, Massey? Um, well, for me, it's a bit of the same situation as Carlo, except for the fact that I was in a, in a solo apartment for my first year. Um, I was, the, the, the one thing that I just want to add from what Carlo said is that there really is a Bocconi sort of area. So even if you're not in a, in a, in, in a residence or, or whatsoever, the Milan isn't as big as well London for those London, but Milan is not very that that big. So most students live within like a 10-15 minute walk from each other. So 
that shouldn't be a factor. And I mean, I have, I had in my first year, I had friends that were in residences, like I had friends that had their own own apartments. So I don't think it has a crazy impact on social life. Obviously, if maybe if you're more worried about making friends and all of that, maybe I'd recommend going into into halls to have a direct contact with people. Um, if you really don't know anyone coming to Milan. I mean, I didn't know anyone and, and ended up in an apartment and still made some, some great friends. So, yeah. Um, so I was in a more of a difficult situation um, because I have, I'm anaphylactic, so I have a lot of different food allergies. So sharing a kitchen for me wasn't, you know, an option. So I ended up getting my own apartment for the, yeah, <laughs> I just couldn't share a house with someone else. <laughs> um, I ended up living on my own for the first year. And then two of my clo- uh, my closest friends moved into the apartment next to me with a shared sort of terrace or well, well, balcony, Very I guess right. you call it. Um, so it was the best of both worlds because I could live on my own and you know have my own kitchen, uh, but I'd also have my closest friends next door. And it, it is much more likely than you think it is that you'll move into either an apartment block or even you know a corridor with someone you already know. Because as people were saying, that there is, you know, a couple kilometers squared that is 95% of the students are all Bocconi. So you do end up finding a lot of people. Um, and again, yeah, you know, moving on your own, living on your own or finding a friend for, through the way Carla did, like you, because you're so close to university, it's still very possible to make friends, to find people you interact with. And yeah, we didn't have someone yeah. who had an Excel sheet, but that sounds kind of cool. Amazing. Yeah. Carla, Carla, Carla went the extra step. Yeah. yeah. It's like WhatsApping people. But yeah, even if you don't find a place, there's countless Facebook groups, WhatsApp groups, yeah. and other things just to make you feel very, very welcome. Because obviously, a lot of the students coming in are, it is their first time away from home, first time living abroad. And they, you know, at least the, the older students really do make an effort to make people feel much more welcome. At least that was my perspective. Right. But yeah. not and associations do help out with that. Yeah, the associations as well. Yeah. None of you sound particularly traumatized by the experience. So uh, finding somewhere to live was not an ordeal as it can be in some some European cities, absolutely. No, no, but you definitely need to plan in advance, that's for sure. Like, you know, yeah, yeah, there's some people who were stuck without one. You really need to do it. Yeah, that's for sure. Um, Good. Okay. Um, there's one question. I don't know if we've already answered this one a little bit, but this is one I'd like to ask while I've got the three of you on. And then I've got a couple that I'm going to come back to with Mario and Elisa. Um, there was a question that was asked about how English or how Italian rather the English taught programs are. So when you're in a class in your politics and government or your economics and finance, what proportion of people are Italian? What proportion are from other places? How does, how does that mix work in reality? So from a personal experience, I've heard that it's roughly 50% of the class will be Italian. And then the other 50 will be international. And it kind of matched perfectly in, in my class. There were half of the students were Italian and then the other half were split up between the major nationalities, which tends to be French. Well, mostly, mostly French students coming in. Um, I mean, Italian, we had a lot of, you know, Turkish, Spanish, Central American. Um, we had one guy from New Zealand. He was lovely. <laughs> he was really nice guy. Um, I, I was the only one from the UK at the time. But then since then, I've met a lot more people coming in, um, and it's nice to see how much how many people have you know joined the call this evening, uh, because for me it was pretty unheard of because this was yeah 2016. Um, no one, no one I knew was coming here, um, and I've met a lot of my old school friends who ended up coming here as well, which is you know mm. nice. <laughs> So they got the message only slower than you did. Okay. Yeah. All right. I would Carl, say uh, in international politics, maybe we, yeah, I think it was uh, 60, 40 for my year, but it does vary by year, but it's 50, 70, 30 maximum, but probably 50, 50 really. And there is um, a bit of a difference. Max, he's right in saying that there's a bit of a difference between that. There are the Italians and then there's the internationals. There is integration in between, but yeah, you, it's not like super merged together. You do tend to stay with the internationals if you're international, but you do have Italian friends, but just not in a group, maybe. Right. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, in the in the BF program, it is it is the same. Um, it's about. I mean, the BF is kind of the more. I say it's probably one of the worst programs for for that statistic. Uh, um, but I mean, it's I still met a lot of a lot of 
my people. And also I do have to say, because it was sounding a bit extremist at the moment, but like even Italian people there, they're very nice. They're always open to talk. They like, obviously they're, they're in international course, so they speak English. Mm. And yeah, I mean, even in, in lectures, you can ask them for help or whatever. No, everyone's very, very helpful. Yeah. It tends to happen very quickly within the first couple of days. So for me personally, it was the first day everyone wanted to be with the international kids and every Italian wanted to be with the Italian kids. Mm-hmm. And then the second day you have Italians in the front row, you've got the French guys on the other side and then the rest. Just <laughs> <in the middle. laughs> I mean, I, I will say, That's a bit rough. When you, when you look at British student behavior in this way, because obviously I've advised people going to many different countries and before they go, they're all asking, you know, are there going to be any other British kids there? And I'm yeah. like, yeah, probably, or maybe not. Why does it matter? And then they all get there and I ask them six months later, so do you hang out with the other Brits much? Oh, no, we see each other occasionally. So it's, yeah, one of yeah. things, it's a really, really big issue in people's imagination. And I understand why. But in reality, it's like once you're on the ground, you just want to get on with the international experience of it, perhaps more. I mean, Massey and I haven't seen each other in like almost a year and we're both British. Yeah, you, so since COVID happened, we haven't seen each other. Well, there's that additional dimension as well, which hopefully yeah. hopefully is only temporary anyway. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, guys. Um, the I mean, do please stick around because you might have some input on these next questions. Um, but I've got four I just quickly want to whiz through. And I think these are more for Mario and uh, Elisa. Um, this first one was inevitably going to come up on a Bocconi related chat in the UK. Uh, will Brexit affect how international students get into the university? Um, I'm going to answer that in one word and say no. I've got some other input on Brexit that I'll come back to, but I would like to ask perhaps Elisa or Mario to say a little bit about how you distinguish between British and other students, if indeed you do at all. Uh, we don't. We don't. So that's very easy for us. It's, uh, it didn't change basically anything. Uh, maybe it will change that we will have more applicants, uh, but, but I don't know. Uh, no, we don't have any. There, there's no difference, of course. Uh, we, uh, any student to apply from uh, a UK school or international school uh, is considered international independently from the nationality. So also for the ones who are in this, in this uh, audience who are Italian and study in, in the UK, they will be considered international. Uh, we, in a way, we, we, we want more international students. So as Maximilian said, we, you know, we, have, we, we aim to 50-50 in all classes. In some classes we have, in other we have 40, so we aim to 50-50. So uh, we, we love to have more and more international, uh, but it doesn't affect. I mean, it's the, 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 it's the, same, the same ranking, the same application. Uh, in the past, uh, the Italian students tend to tended to do the, the, the test uh, versus the international students uh, tended to do the, the AC, a, SAT, not all of them, as we, as we said, uh, as we've seen. Uh, but nowadays it's more, you know, with the online option, there are more students to take also the test, but no difference. Well, the SAT is essentially online as well now, if you can get to do it anyway, isn't it? So it doesn't really make so much of, much of a difference. But in terms of um, fees and things like that, you charge the same for everybody as well, don't you? Same, the same. No, there's no difference. Uh, the fees, uh, Bocconi, it's uh, 13,000 uh, euros per year for three years, uh, but only, let's say, less than 70% of the students pay the full fee because there are lots of scholarship, lots of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, you know, full um, fee, fee waiver scholarship, but also uh, 50% reduction or reduction of the fee, depending on, uh, economic conditions, but uh, but many depending on uh, uh, merit. Uh, let's say these are merit scholarships. So yes, right. okay. there are no differences. No. Uh, one slightly, I mean, one thing I just want to contribute on the topic of Brexit, um, relating more to student visas now. Um, obviously, we are 13 days outside the European Union. Things are not yet nailed down in any significant way. We are already encountering problems in Spain with students trying to re-enter the country, which is uh, nonsensical, unfortunately. Uh, but um, I do think that over time, visas will become necessary for Italy because they will be necessary for Italians coming to the UK. But I also think that, you know, it will be a relatively straight... <coughs> straightforward process so I don't think there's anything to get worried about there all I would do is say that yes if you were thinking about leaving it to the last minute that's another reason why perhaps you shouldn't 
But Mark, if I can add something on this, uh, the process for UK students who want to come and study in Italy has actually been released um, super recently by the Italian government. Students shouldn't worry too much because the procedure is the same as, you know, for all students who come from outside the EU. We have a permit of safe procedure that is dedicated to students and is pretty straightforward. And most of the universities try and help out students in order to, you know, sort that out once they come to, to the university. So definitely, as you said, the visa thing has to be uh, you know kept into consideration but as far as then the procedures once you get into Italy you shouldn't worry too much because really in our case for example we have an external agency helping us out with that but still we try and provide the smoothest arrival for international students so the UK kids are just be as just going to you know uh, use all the services that we already have in place for international students. Right good and of course you have plentiful experience of dealing with international students so it should be just you know. Oh, absolutely. With plenty of students coming from uh, places where you, where you need a visa. No, let me add one nice thing about that happened to, to me. I was in charge before doing this job. I was in charge of international relations and exchange agreements. And, uh, you know, when uh, Brexit, you know, happened, you know, it, when, the first time I would say when it started, when it all started, all our partner schools, 25 in the UK, approached me saying, we are continuing to exchange students to do exchanges with you independently from the Erasmus funds. So this, this was great. So we already, we, we, we have in place the same agreements as before, like it, 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 these, are, these would become agreements like outside the, the, EU, the EU, but very simple. Everybody says, uh, uh, we want you to accept our students again and, uh, and not, don't interrupt and we welcome your students there. So this is very, very nice. You know, it gives you, uh, you know, hope for the, the best for, for this relationship. Yeah. Okay. On the academic side. <laughs> no, because that, that exchange issue is certainly, uh, it's upset a lot of people in the last few weeks. Let's put it that way. Um, the next question I'd like to ask, in fact, I, let me see. I do have to deal with these all separately. Uh, one of them is very specific to the, the social sciences degree that you have there. Is it social science based or more economics? Does the economics DNA dominate the social science program? Is there a simple answer to that? Elisa or myself? Uh, either. Okay. Okay. I mean, okay. I mean, <laughs> No, the, yeah, economics, uh, yes, you, you got it right. I mean, I don't know who, I, well, yeah, I, I'm gonna check. Who is the, you got it right, you're very well prepared. Yes, I think economics uh, dominates a bit, the economics and social sciences degree. Uh, it's very quantitative and it has also kind of, you know, psychology, sociology and all that stuff, but it's a, it's quantitative course. That course is very, it's very, you know, it's the top students of that course usually then continue and do a master and the placement, for example, of our master in economics and social sciences in the PhDs in the US and UK, it's fantastic. Uh, those students are very well motivated. And, and so, of course, this is not all the class, are only the top students. But, you know, if you're, not, if you're looking from, uh, for a lighter course in terms of quantitative uh, subjects, don't go for that course. Right. Okay, thanks. That's quite clear. Um, just one uh, question that I opened and then closed before we answered. Is there a simple answer to this question of what would be a competitive GPA for the IB? What kind of score would people, what are you looking for? Well, we do not ask for specific GPAs. It's one of the two main elements, I would say, of admission. So it always has to be coupled with the test performance. But as far as the IB goes, usually good candidates graduate with at least a 36 in the IB, six in each subject, something like that. This again, it's not a minimum school, a minimum GPA, but it gives you an indication of the kind of applicant we look for. Right. And again, one of the other questions we have here, which I think you touched on already, Elisa, what A-level subjects do Bocconi favor or recommend to take? Um, Nothing in specific. I would say the only rule, so to say, that we have is that we do not accept critical thinking in general studies as one of the, you know, the three A-levels that you need. Uh, but apart from that, you can apply with any A-level you have However, uh, we usually suggest students to take at least one quantitative subject at A levels, uh, at A levels, uh, because of the reason Mario explained at the beginning. Anyway, at Bocconi you have economics, politics, quantitative subjects, so you might want to have that kind of analytical and quantitative background that helps you not for admissions, but once you get accepted, in order to sort of start the transition to university studies a bit more smoothly, because you have that strong analytical background. But again it's not uh, a requirement. 
Okay, thank you. Marcy's got his hand raised. I don't know if that's deliberate. Is there anything you wanted to, to say on that point? I, yeah, um, I, I would say that even choosing, um, you know, one of the courses which is supposedly less maths oriented, it, everything at Bocconi is very, very quantitative. So take, I, I would very much suggest taking maths at A-level or economics at A-level. Um, I, I took both maths, economics and politics. And so for me, the transition wasn't as hard, but there were some students coming from non maths backgrounds and it was, you know, much more uh, difficult. I, I don't know what Carla did, but the majority around uh, Bocconi is very quantitative and somehow they can put maths anywhere. Yeah, uh, no, maths is right. I mean, I think with a quantitative background, you, it, it's easier for you to, you know, to adjust to yeah. the way of teaching that Bocconi has, the subject that Bocconi has, it's not mandatory, but if you, for example, are a junior student, so you still have the chance to choose your A-levels, Matsi's suggestion is definitely spot on. So taking at least math or business or econ will help you um, a bit, yeah. I mean, whenever I see people who ask those kind of questions, I'm usually drawn to the fact that they're probably quite attracted to Bocconi, but not necessarily quite so attracted to math, statistics, <laughs> economics, etc. It, it, it's difficult. It, it's it's very doable. It is doable if you're ready to become fascinated by maths. Um, but it's obviously better if that's kind of uh, more it comes more naturally to you. Um, the teachers and the professors are constantly trying to help you by giving you, you know, they have a lot of op uh, open office hours, et cetera. So you can improve and develop your math skills. But if you're not interested in mathematics or anything quantitative, I, I would personally suggest against Bocconi um, because as I said before, maths is very much pushed um, in a lot of the subjects because at the end of the day, in the fields that we are hoping to go into, uh, a quantitative mindset is very much required. Uh, so that would that, be my personal experience. Thank uh, you very much. I think, I think that's very clear that, you know, yes, you can develop this, but you have to want to. And yeah. if you want to avoid it, that's not really going to work. Yeah. Um, next question that came up, well, there's actually two. One I think we can deal with quite quickly, which just says, is it true for a long-term student visa you have to prove you have sufficient financial means to support your studies? I mean, that's quite normal, isn't it, Elisa, I would say? Uh, yes, it is. I don't know specifically, you know, the amount for the visas, but as for the permit of stay, once you get to Italy, anyways, when you, you know, you sort of, you have your permit of residence to stay here, then you have to show that you have the means to support yourself. So you do need to um, send a copy of your financial statement that attests that. If you have scholarships or something like that, that is taken into consideration, but still you, I think it's pretty normal in all countries to have that um as a requirement so yeah, yeah. It, it certainly is and we're certainly seeing that for british students now going to the netherlands for example post brexit they have to prove that they have that money too so i think this is going to be a feature of pretty much every student visa you ever apply for um, so i don't think there's a way around that um, the final question we got up here again this is probably one for you and lisa as well what are admissions officers looking for in the personal letter your interest in the academic course or other aspects like activities, location, teaching style? Should the letter also be used to talk about your previous experiences or focus on motivations and the future? Wow, that's a lot of, uh, I don't know yeah. anything else that you could <laughs> would come into context. I'll try to be quick. And, <laughs> no, it's super complicated, but we get the, this question a lot. So uh, first of all, the personal statements of the letter doesn't need to be 10 pages long. It's not an essay. We don't want to know about your entire life. What we want you to write as a one page uh, personal statement where you tell us why you're applying to that or those courses. So give us a motivation of why specifically you're interested in that or those programs you're listing. Uh, and then what you would like to achieve by attending those courses. So your future goals, you're perfectly right. And apart from that, something related to your background, maybe why should we pick you? Why, what are your, the experiences you'd like to let us know about? Just think that we see your GPA and your test scores. So the personal statement is the document where you can tell us anything we cannot assume from the quantitative documents that you send us. So anything related to your motivation, um, you know, uh, the extracurricular or extra activities you've done during high school. So any, I would say, element that helps us 
sort of build around profile of yourself. But focus firstly on the motivation. So why the course, why those courses, why Bocconi? So that motivation side is very important. Okay, thank you very much. Um, thank you everybody who's still on this call, uh, one, hour, one and a quarter hours after we started. Um, that more or less concludes all of the questions that you have asked. Uh, clearly, you will have opportunities to ask Elisa, uh, Mario, or me, or anybody actually afterwards uh, via email. No problem there at all. Um, we will make sure for those of you who want to see the slides, the presentation, and so on, uh, that you can do so. Um, and absolutely, um, you know, this will be a resource that you can refer back to now. Um, so. Absolutely. I, I'm going to conclude that. Mario, Elisa, anything you want to say on behalf of Bocconi? Well, thank you so much. Thank you for participating in this, uh, in this uh, session. It's been very nice for me. And uh, thank you, Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I hope to see you whether online or in person soon. Okay. Good evening. We're going to leave it there. Thank you very much for coming.